All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Tonight's speaker is Aziz Huck. He's a professor at the University of Chicago who's written on just a breathtaking array of topics in constitutional law, from the separation of powers to federalism to judicial power to non-discrimination norms in the Constitution to the war on terror. It's just an incredibly breathtaking body of work. Uh, and tonight he's here to share with us his views on um, presidential impeachment uh, from a comparative perspective. So join me in thanking him for being here. So I, I'm very grateful to, uh, to Chaz and to Michael uh, McConnell for uh, extending an invitation for me uh, uh, to do this event. Uh, uh, and it's a real honor to do anything related to the Constitutional Law Center uh, at Stanford, which I think is one of the premier institutions of its kind around the country. My topic today is uh, the design and operation of constitutional provisions for the removal of a chief executive uh, as they are installed and operated in constitutions around the world. Uh, this, uh, what I will present draws upon research that uh, I've done with uh, my colleague, Tom Ginsberg, uh, and David Landon, who teaches uh, at FSU in Florida. Um, uh, and what, I, what, I, what it focuses upon is a relatively narrow problem. How do constitutions solve the problem that arises when there is a compelling reason to remove an elected chief executive from office outside of the framework of elections or term limits, right? How does, how does that process of presidential uh, removal or impeachment occur? Uh, before I share some of our findings and analysis, uh, I want to set out two reasons why I think that this question of comparative law is one of interest, and one reason why it's not. So the first reason is that uh, across the second half of the 20th century, uh, around the world, there has been a secular growth, uh, not just in governmental authority generally, but more particularly in executive power. Uh, this is in part a function of new bureaucratic technologies being uh, 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 developed. But an important part, it's also a function of changing norms and aspirations about the appropriate policy and transformational asp aspirations of government, right? Our, our expectations of government around the world have changed uh, as government's capacity has changed. And at the forefront of these expansions have been executives. Uh, moreover, uh, moreover uh, recent work in political science demonstrates that uh, within the world of elected executives, there has been uh, a degree of convergence to a single type, which is more the presidential type than the part of the, the ministerial type. That is, uh, the world used to be, the political scientists used to think of the world as being organized into presidential, semi-presidential, parliamentary systems. What we see is parliamentary systems behaving much more like presidential systems. And so the question of how elected chief uh, uh, executives get, get uh, removed turns out to be of increasing interest as more and more polities have something, an office, whether or not it's denominated as a president, acts like the president uh, in, uh, in, in practice. Um, a second reason why it, it's worth thinking about presidential removal through a comparative lens is that we don't have the empirical resources to think about that question in the United States based on our own constitutional history. There have only been two attempted impeachments of presidents uh, through American history. To be sure, there have been 19 instances in which a cabinet officer has been but there's good reason to think that the treatment of cabinet-level officials raises distinct norms and 
normative and institutional design questions than the removal of presidents who are popularly elected, right? So our, our, our empirical basis for making judgments about how impeachment will affect other elements of our democratic system is pretty thin in the United States, right? We just don't know what impeachment does to the functioning of a democracy. By looking more broadly and comparatively, we can at least start to fill that gap. Right. So that's two reasons to why one, one might be interested in this question. Here's a reason why one would not be interested in this question. I, I don't think that anything I have to say has a bearing directly on the wisdom or the legality of the uh, of questions arising in the present debate about impeachment in the U.S. context. Um, indeed, indeed, there, there's a sense, or I, I, would, I would submit, that the very existence of this paper demonstrates my incapacity to speak about it. So Tom Ginsburg and I have been writing about democratic erosion for a couple of years, and we've toyed with the idea of writing about but we thought it was too friendly, uh, uh, too immediate a topic. And it was only after the uh, Mueller testimony that some of us, that we thought, right, now is the chance when there's uh, not immediate public attention on the, on the dynamics of impeachment, right, that we could write something that the law reviews will be interested in, but that isn't immediately taken as a Right, so that's the caveat. Right. Um, so rather than trying to say something about the present political moment, what I'll try and do is persuade you that there is something interesting and more general to be learned by studying presidential removal in its contemporary global uh, context. Um, somewhat surprisingly, it turns out that there is no published work on that topic. Right? Nobody has looked at how presidents get removed around the world. There's a small political science literature on the frequency of calls for impeachment, but none, nobody has looked at how the design in law of impeachment processes influences the rate or the nature of impeachment proceedings uh, that follow. And, and while I don't think that what I'll, what I'll show you today answers every question that one can uh, pull from that interaction between law and practice, I, I hope what we, will, what we do is, is at least provide a start in answering some interesting questions. So that there's an underlying paper which I, I reference uh, on, the, on the title slide. What I'm going to do today is to walk you through one element of that. The element is essentially the series of empirical and findings that we reach by looking out at the world and seeing what's there. This is going to be largely scripted rather than uh, causal inference uh, 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 findings. Um, the paper also has a suite of case studies that look at a series of recent around the world. South Korea, Brazil, uh, South Africa, uh, Paraguay. I'm not going to talk about those, uh, although uh, if there are kind of specific questions about uh, some of those countries, I'm more than happy to uh, grapple with them uh, later in, in the Q&A. Okay, so let's talk about, well, let's, let's, let's take a look at uh, how other countries' constitutions, how globally the problem of presidential removal or impeachment is handled. What do other countries do? And we might think of this problem as one of both substance and uh, procedure. Okay, I'm going to do procedure first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about substance. And then I'll say something about consequences, right? What happens given the choice of certain kinds of uh, provisions? Um, in the, what do we see happening on the ground? Okay, so the first point to make, the first point to make, is that overwhelmingly other constitutional designers view presidential impeachment as a question of foundational uh, uh, importance that has
has to be addressed in a constitution. Nine out of ten constitutions that uh, uh, contain a presidential or semi-presidential system address directly how that president will be removed in their constitution, right? Uh, at least as far as commonalities across constitutional design goes, uh, this is uh, a relatively uh, a, a, a relatively useful. Now, this is not to say that ordinary politics in the form of statutes or regulations can't play a role in the way that impeachment happens. An example of that comes from Brazil. The Brazilian Constitution of 1988 lays out procedures and a substantive standard that I'll, I'll show later in the presentation for when and how the Brazilian president can be impeached. Right? But, but Brazilian commentators emphasize that a law enacted before the 1988 Constitution, a 1950 law, uh, <laughs> Law 1079, Provide, which sets out further procedural details and describes more about the, the circumstances of the which uh, presidents will be uh, in the Law 1079 in Brazil, it seems, has more influence on the actual practice of impeachment than on than the Constitution itself. Right? So, so even if you have, even if you're in this nine out of ten cases, in which the Constitution addresses impeachment, you can have law in the form of ordinary statutes bubbling up and altering or shifting the pathways envisaged in the Constitution. So an important thing to bear in mind in consuming all of the things that I'm about to show you is that I'm talking about Constitution. Most of the data that I have is about text of Constitution. But there's this underlying morass of statutory law and regulations that might, mm -hmm. under certain circumstances, be peeking it out into uh, the, the practical operation of impeachment in certain contexts. We don't have the data to look at that consistently or, or systematically, but it's, a, it's an important question that we, that we hope either we or somebody else does some work on in the future. Okay. So there's consensus on the constitutionalization of impeachment. Is there consensus, though, on how an impeachment ought to happen? Let's start off by thinking about uh, the process uh, of uh, impeachment. Who is it? Who is it that decides when a president is impeached? And what kind of hurdles do they have to overcome? So this is, this is a lot of information, but uh, let me explain it to you. Over on the left-hand side, what we have is a list of who, uh, which entity within the government can propose impeachment, what the voting threshold is, and then whether there's some kind of a ratification. Right? The ratification <coughs> The core thing, the core takeaway from uh, this chart or from this table um, is that overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, impeachment is a matter for legislation. Right? It is the lower house, both houses, or the upper house that begins impeachment procedures. And on the, on the in third column, again, the lower house, the upper house, or both houses, uh, again, numerically predominant. Right? So the dominant pattern we see around the world is impeachment flowing through a legislative body, one democratic body, judges, the bona fides of another. That is not to say that, it, that legislatures are the be-all and end-all of impeachment, right? The United States Constitution suggests famously the House and the Senate, the majority of the legislatures the have a role in impeachment trials, but it's it's not been, at least until now, understood to be a terribly substantive role. That is not a practice that is followed around the world. Courts in many jurisdictions play an important part of impeachment. In some places, courts are tasked with ensuring that the process, the constitutional process, for impeachment has been followed. But there are 
are some instances in which courts may first order judgments on the validity of the impeachment. So, for example, in uh, the impeachment in South Korea of President Park, after the lower and the upper houses of the Korean government had voted to impeach, Park's case goes to the Korean Supreme Court, which has to sign off, which has to agree that the impeachment is lawful. In certain South American countries, there is a bifurcation. Right? This is true in Colombia and, uh, and in Brazil. Right? There are two pathways you can get to impeachment. If you have, on the one hand, a crime in the exercise of constitutional functions or uh, unworthiness for bad conduct, Impeachment is channeled exclusively through a legislative channel, House then Upper House, Lower House then Upper House. But in both Colombia and in Brazil, if impeachment is for an ordinary criminal offense, right, if the president murders somebody, right, the legislature is not involved. It, it flows through the, uh, the, uh, the criminal chamber of the high court. So, so courts can be given a role, and the judicial, the, the, you can give the judiciary a role in some instances, but not in others. Uh, certainly, the, the, it's not obvious why, or it's not obvious that the, uh, the U.S. solution of the judiciary is necessarily uh, the only uh, sensible one. One last point about this case. Notice that the public that the role. In Colombia, members of the public can uh, constitutionally petition the legislature asking for an impeachment. Right? So you can, you can have a trigger that is public facing. Or at the back end of the process, you can have a, a referendum. So in Gambia, once the president is impeached, the, the public votes. There's a referendum upon whether the uh, validity, uh, on the validity of that impeachment. So there's variety here in this table, but there are patterns. There are, there are stable regularities across different constitutions. Um, and there, in, in many ways, the United States, and I'll emphasize whether the United States is in harmony or at odds with international practice at uh, 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 various points. In many ways, the United States is, is, is pretty consistent with international What about substance? So I've said, look, here's the process, here's the number of players that are involved, but what about the rules, what about the rules that govern under what circumstances a president can be So uh, here are the rules from the uh, 149 constitutions presently in force, or in force as of 2018, which is when the data set goes up to, uh, that set out under what circumstances a president can be impeached. Right? Whether for crime, for violations of the Constitution, incapacity, things about the 20th Amendment, treason, general dissatisfaction, and other. Right. Let me make a few comments about this. It's not surprising that criminality is, by a, a reasonable margin, the most frequently encountered ground for removing a president. But notice that in 40% of cases in which the Constitution a constitution sets forth a rule for when a president can be removed, it does not mention criminality. The so criminality is, is a majority, but not a supermajority characteristic of impeachment provisions. Um, second observation. Um, notice how frequently uh, violations of the constitution or uh, violations of the, uh, of the president's oath, which is the other way in which this uh, category gets formulated in the text of the Constitution, uh, is present in a, in, in a removal provision. Right? Almost, but not quite, as frequently as uh, criminal, criminal violations. Um, uh, uh, the, the way in which this, this second category is specified turns out to vary between different cases. Uh, in many instances, but certainly not in all, there is a requirement that the violation of the Constitution be willful, right? Somehow be uh, in intentional. 
Um, okay. One of the most interesting categories for, for our purposes is this fifth one. This idea that a president can be removed from office, not because they have done something wrong, but because there is some sort of dissatisfaction, some sort of uh, uh, resistance to their remaining in office that doesn't rise to the level of a specific violation, either of the criminal law or of the Constitution. How do different constitutions uh, operationalize this? About 13% of the Constitution have something like this. Let me give you two examples. So this is the Constitution of Ghana, which uh, says that if, if a person brings into ridicule or contempt the Constitution or does something prejudicial or inimical the economy and security of the state, they're out, or they're potentially out. Similarly, similarly, um, Brazil, <coughs> Brazil has this language about attempts against the federal constitution as a ground for impeachment. Right? Uh, I, you know, I, we could also point to number uh, four and number and number six. Internal security of the country, probity administration, and the budget. When Dilma Rousseff, who was the uh, successor to President Lula, was impeached a few years ago, the basis for her impeachment was the diversion of public monies from their appropriated object to a public benefit scheme that hadn't been fully funded. That was the basis. Right, probity administ in administration was the basis for her uh, removal from office. So, the, so let me let me let me let me knit together now what I just said about process and stuff. So, those of you who are law students or lawyers in the room may have come across the idea that is often associated with the criminal law scholar Bill Stumps that we should think about process and substance. So, for example, someone says, look, when the Supreme Court in the 1960s made it more difficult to uh, uh, obtain guilty verdicts for in criminal cases by increasing the procedural hurdles that the prosecutor had to overcome, legislatures at the state level responded by just expanding the domain of criminal liability. Right? Procedure and substance interact, and they can in part be substituted for each other. So, they're both making both just tools for making it more, more difficult to achieve a certain result. Right? So uh, one thing we might want to do is to think about, well, are, are, are constitutions in which it's difficult to impeach the procedural matter, ones in which the standard for impeachment is low, <coughs> or do the, the impeachment standard and the kind of process used for impeachment, does it run together? So to think about this question, what we did is to create an index that measures the difficulty of removing a president, both in terms of substance and And then to think about how that index, and then to array more modification ones. So this is what we get. So here's, here's an explanation of this. This, the first uh, leftmost category, is our cases in which it's pretty simple to remove, right? You, 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 you have a pretty straightforward procedure. Basically, this means there's only one player, one institution that's involved. This is medium difficulty of process, basically two players. Really difficult, three players or more. And we also count voting thresholds to be. And then within each of these uh, easy, medium, difficult to remove, uh, we sort constitutions according to how tough the standard is to uh, hit that. Okay, two, two observations about this chart. First, by and large, a majority of uh, jurisdictions around the world, countries around the world, process and substance run together. If you have easy process, you have easy substance. If you have medium process, you have medium substance. They do come apart in this uh, category here. <coughs> Second observation. There's actually a 
reasonable degree of clumping in the middle. That is, most constitutions have adopted something like a Goldilocks solution. Right? Don't make it too difficult to remove, don't make it too easy. Make it pick some intermediate uh, Goldilocks uh, solution. Um, the United States is firmly within this category. So the United States falls within the median in the middle of constitutional practice as compared to other constitutions around the country. This is in striking uh, contrast with uh, other features of the, United, of the Constitution. Our Constitution is way shorter, way less specific than other constitutions around the world. It's also way more difficult to amend. Right? Our Constitution is by far and away uh, among the most difficult to amend constitutions um, in the world. Right? So, so this tells us something about where we fall, where the U.S. falls, uh, in, in relation to other countries. So, so that tells you something about what the landscape of constitutional design is like. What does this mean in practice? How does it, how does it play out? Here, here uh, are a lot of answers, right? And, and I'd love to know the questions that one, one ought to ask as follow-up to this. But let's look at consequences. Okay, the first way of thinking about consequences is just to say, well, look, what does the Constitution say happens after somebody is impeached? Who, who, gets, who gets to fill that office? Now, we had expected, we had expected there to be, by and large, a procedure in which the legislature decides who gets filled an office. We thought that because there are many constitutional democracies and presidencies around the world in which legislatures play a role in selecting. But that turns out not to be the case for our surprise. By and large, the consequence of our impeachment is a new election. We, we think about this in the paper as the hard reading process. When your constitutional system is in paralysis or in crisis, when impeachment is employed as a, uh, a device to get the stuff, the, the Dominant approach is to start afresh with whole new elections. The dominance of elections also reflects, at least arguably, a widespread recognition that impeachment is democratically problematic. A widespread recognition that if you have on somebody other than the electorate, and remember there's only a small number of places in which the electorate has a role in the media. You have some actor other than the, than the, the uh, electorate removing your president. You need to have some sort of uh, some sort of re-legitimating mechanism, right? And the dominance of elections uh, seems to seems to be the way that the law uh, has approached that. So we can think about this problem in terms of law, uh, but we can also think about the problem in terms of practice. We can think about how provisions are used on the ground. Again, this is one of these not super, uh, super helpful tables, but let me walk you through it. So uh, this, is, this is data from a book of science called Young King. Uh, Young King collected and, uh, and, uh, and ranked uh, instances in which a legislature or other body starts to impeach a president around the world and measure how far along <coughs> In that process, a, uh, a legislative body or other body got right. So each each of these rows is uh, you can think of as standing for getting a getting a little bit further in the process of impeachment. Right? Uh, and you can see that as we go from the, the very first stage, which is somebody throwing out the idea, hey, let's let's let's, let's have a formal vote on impeachment, right? Uh, to efforts to put uh, the impeachment question on the parliamentary agenda, right, the numbers go down. And then notice this number. Out of the 154 uh, efforts at impeachment that we were able to identify by supplementing things data uh, from uh, 1990 to 2010, there are, uh, there are 154 instances, 
154 instances in which impeachment is raised on the, the, the national political agenda uh, in some fashion. Uh, these 100, sorry, not 154, 100, yeah, 154 across 63 different countries. So each of these countries has, on average, 1.5 calls for impeachment. And out of those 154, actually 10 cases of impeachment arise. Right. How are they distributed across time? This shows you the timing uh, between uh, 1990 and uh, 2018. This shows you the timing of calls in Parliament for impeachment formal moves to impeach, and then actual impeachment. Um, what this, this chart surprised us. We were expecting to see a spike here. We were expecting to see, after the global financial crisis, a wave of dissatisfaction with the way in which uh, governments have handled the economic shock and a consequent wave of pressure to get rid of uh, uh, of sitting government, right? And you just don't see that, right? In fact, I would say that there's not really a pattern here, right? I, I don't discern if there's a pattern um, uh, uh, above and beyond randomness, right? Uh, and that would suggest that there isn't, there aren't clear cycles globally in, in So final question, and then I'll open things up. What happens after someone is impeached? What happens uh, in particular, to the quality of the democracy after impeachment has come to school. So there are a number of different measures employed to make cross-country comparisons of uh, the quality of a democracy. Uh, the one that we chose to use is called the Policy 2 School. The Policy 2 School has uh, a, a 0 to 21 scale, uh, and 6 is the threshold for what counts as a democracy, right? So what we did is we uh, took the policy two scores and we looked at the couple of years after an impeachment had happened in those 10 places where uh, impeachment had actually been instituted. Somebody had actually been kicked out of office. Okay, well, the democracy gets that. So here's the table, right? And, and what matters really here is the delta. Let me make two, uh, I'm going to make one comment about, uh, about the Delta and then one comment about the Delta. So the first comment is, um, by and large, by and large, when a country impeaches its president, the quality of its democracy does not get better. Right? True, Car sorry, Madagascar goes down, but it drops from eight or six. So it remains one, right? Um, I don't think that, that Peru, which goes up by eight in the two years after Christian is really tells us anything. What's going on there is that, is that Peru is coming out of the contracted period of military dictatorship and it's deepening its democratic institutions for reasons that are related to the Fujimori uh, uh, impeachment, but they're not exactly the same. Not, not the impeachment right? okay. So what this shows, what this shows is that impeachment doesn't seem to threaten Um, the second thing to, to flag uh, on this table um, is of the people who were removed here, 50% of them were removed for something other than a criminal act. So Lugo in Paraguay, Rousseff in uh, Brazil, uh, Park in South Korea, Wahid in Indonesia, and uh, Paxas in Lithuania were all removed on, on the basis of something like violations of the Constitution, uh, administrative infidelity, and the like. That is, if you're removed from office as a person, you have a 50% chance of having been removed, not because of the criminal offense, but because of general dissatisfaction in, uh, or, or, or some sort of alleged violation or, or interaction with the uh, the Constitution, or alleged infraction of uh, the Constitution. 
Um, we looked at the cases uh, that we, that these, 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 uh, these 10 cases, and we tried to come up with some sort of a generalization about the circumstances in which uh, uh, impeachment uh, occurs, right? Um, what seems to be the case is that, and this is a very rough generalization, uh, is that when impeachment happens, it happens uh, at a moment in time of which the legislature is in the hands of the opposing party. And the opposing party is able to peel off a measure of support for impeachment from the, uh, the president's party. That is normally very <coughs> So let me, let me close by, by drawing a couple of a very, very high level and, and general conclusions about what this, is, this research uh, shows. Uh, although I, I want to stress, as I think I try to do throughout, that there's a whole series of questions I think we haven't answered. Um, so this is the first time anyone's looked at how these have gone around the world. Uh, and what we see is that there is actually a surprising degree of consensus on both substance and procedure. And when you put substance and procedure together, most countries have, have adopted a middle of the road, what I call a Goldilocks uh, uh, solution, and that the United States is well within that global norm, unlike other elements of our constitutional uh, order. Um, we also show that impeachment calls are not that infrequent. Um, and this is just things that, by the way, the, the data I presented was only on the system where the impeachment uh, call makes its way into a formal revolution of the election. So, for example, at least so far, the United States in 2019 would not count. Right? So there's been no formally opened impeachment um, inquiry. Right? Uh, what we see is that, is that you do get impeachments happening. Right? The, the U.S. experience of having no and that when impeachments do happen, it's not necessarily because the president has committed a crime. It's, it's more, uh, it's, it's as likely that, uh, that the president has somehow found himself or herself in conflict with what are believed to be generally accepted norms of the constitutional system. And that when the removal happens, So if you have a question, just come up to either of these two mics and we'll just take them in order until 7 o'clock. Hello, Professor Huck. Um, I wanted to ask on the slide about substance for impeachment. You had an other category and a number of countries fell into that. I was curious, what are the other grounds? Wait, let me make sure that I'm... I'm There. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, so, so like the, the, the parable answer is uh, stuff that doesn't fit into any of these uh, provisions. Right? So, for example, um, so I, I don't recall the specifics of this, um, but I, I, let me give you an example. Right? There are many constitutions around the world that contain obligations that are not. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, that the United States falls somewhat in the middle uh, in terms of the difficulty of impeachment, um, but you also noted that we have never had a removal. Um, do you have a, a hypothesis as to why that may be the case? Yeah, so, so um, the constitutional standard for impeachment um, covers high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, the evidence uh, that has been well canvassed by uh, a generation of scholars like Albert and Bob Black suggests that the language originally was intended to encompass a class of cases that are not exhausted by uh, criminal. Serious abuses of office in the fashion that impeachment proceedings in the English Tudor and early Stuart uh, context have been. Um, so we have a provision that's, that's available for both criminal and non criminal cases, right? Uh, arguably, crimes, maybe violations of the Constitution, uh, probably not general dissatisfaction, right? But certainly these two. Uh, what happens early on, and I'm, I'm here indebted to the really terrific historical work of the scholar of the is that as, as, as soon as the 1820s, you start to hear people talking about impeachment as if it is just predicated upon crime. So I think that there's a there's kind of push at the present historical moment to view the crime, not or crime plus interpretations of high crime. As like a, as an artifact of past and competition. Actually, there seems to have been a, a real push of Great Britain to define criminality, to define criminality as a basis for And he argues that this explains the inclusion of some articles of impeachment over the professor like and Jackson, such as the violation of the Compass Act, that would kind of not, not really clear what that would really be the case for Great Britain, but it was, it was a criminal act. And you could, and, and that was understood to be. Griffin argues that, that what, what, what's doing the work there is um, partisan pressure. So there, was, there, was, there were pressures from, from parties from both sides early on to resolve on a crystal clear uh, uh, impeachment standard, right? One that was intended for work with the time for relatively strict uh, impeachment standard. Although well, notice that there's a kind of this matter, what's the right? Impeachment in the United States, as in many other places, is a matter of law. Right? The investigation of crimes is today notwithstanding generally something that the legislature do, but they're certainly not introducing the law of the And so by converging upon crime and by getting rid of the responsibility of using constitutional infidelity or general dissatisfaction, right, you, you you narrow the circumstances under which but you also narrow them into toward a class of cases that the legislature is truly in, in a net at executing and following through on, which they just don't really have the apparatus that you would need to determine whether a crime occurred, right? especially because, as we're reminded constantly, many crimes have a mental state requirement, a mens rea is what it is. And it's really hard for Congress to get a mens rea. So you have this convergence on an on, on interpretation of these that makes, has, that according to Britain, has a partisan term, but it's institutionally at odds with the allocation of responsibility for it. So I, that, I think, is why we see impeachment happening. So that's my best explanation of how I, I really admit that it's open to the other responsibility. Um, but notice what we have impeachment really infrequently, not just with presidents, but with cabinet officials. It can't be that we've only had 19 cabinet officials who violated the law. Mm -hmm. But that was a great, great right? So something else, so something must be going on, right? That is institutionally blocking <coughs> impeachment from playing the function that it looks like it ought to play, even on the narrow reading of the book. Right? So I think I would try to offer one explanation for that, but I absolutely can see that the explanation that I just offered doesn't flow from this data. It flows from an interpretation of the history. And you know, there, there, there might well be a better interpretation. I think it's the, it's the one that I would try. Does that help? Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Yeah. Um, 
tax is self-explanatory. You think you can put the tax and know what it means. But no, 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 no. Right? You have smart lawyers like Chaz who will tell you the tax actually has this uh, particular articulated idiosyncratic meaning that applies to how it's part of the context. And you only get that meaning if you immerse yourself in that meaning. So that is absolutely a, uh, a fair criticism. Uh, although, just think about how hard it is to get any kind of synoptic, any kind of global perspective if you're trying to get that local granularity. really hard. So what all we're saying when we compare the US in terms of difficulty with other jurisdictions is look, you just look at the face of the constitution, this is where we are, like Paris and other country, and then absolutely, once you, once you understand where the text leads us, then there's this question about are there these other forces that are leading us to the constitutional that are pushing us away from where we might be, right? Uh, given where the text is. Right? And if you want it to be normative, although we know we're not normative in the paper, um, uh, you might say, look, uh, this is where the text is, this is where the practice is. I mean, gosh, we could we could get back to the text. And, and it turns out we show that there's no big loss of democratic politics or democratic destruction. So that's kind of a normative takeaway, but it's, it's open to the readers to draw their inference and we're not there. We're only doing that. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. We have a question. You have a ch uh, table there where you mention all the, where you list all the places where the procedure has started, an impeachment procedure has started. Yeah. How far it, it went. Yeah. Do you do you know uh, how it, how are these procedures uh, or proceedings like distributed geographically? Are they concentrated in very few countries? Is this yeah. kind of widespread by regions? And <clears throat> also kind of con connected to that, I wanted to know if if you if you know if, if this is if, the, if they are concentrated in a few countries, yeah. is there a way to say that uh, kind of in those places impeachment has kind of become part of politics? It's just I, I can imagine Brazil, a country that has uh, impeached two country two presidents in such short time. Like it's it just it's just how politics goes in those countries, or whether it's very widespread. And it's kind of just random or very unlikely that it happens in specific places. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think this is a really important question, and, look, and I think that's a good one. So, so the first is look, you have 154 instances, 154 instances, some kind of call for uh, impeachment, and out of those, only 10 um, uh, actually uh, 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 yield impeachment. Brazil only appears once. But it's worth noticing that in South Korea also, an earlier president, President Roe, was impeached by the legislature. But then the Supreme Court said, well, we don't think that it was enough, that there was enough evidence for impeachment. He was impeached, but he's saved from the news, so to speak, by the Supreme Court. So at least in two of our cases, there might be something like a knock on effect or a, a path marking effect. But one, you do impeach them once. Anything done for the first time creates a path effect. Do it once and then it becomes more easy. Right? And so that's absolutely possible at the level of the country. Right? It does appear, it does appear um, uh, from uh, the parts of the data that I'm not familiar with that there's some geographic dispersion in the one country. There's certainly geographic dispersion in the text. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't preclude the possibility that you're depriving of clumping within some subcategories, within some, some, some parts. Then, then the really interesting question, that we're, which we started to talk about before we start, is well, how do we slice up the world right, to think about where the 154 is, is, <coughs> is, is located? But one possibility is we uh, designated. Well, look, is there something that's happening in Latin America? Is there something that's happening in Africa? Is there something that's happening in Africa? Right? And so that's something that we need to do. The second thing that we can do is we can slice the world by democratic policy. Right? So look, there's, there's one group of countries that is uh, above the median in terms of democratic policy, and another group of countries is below the median. Right? And let's think about does impeachment tend to happen in, in high policy or low policy? That's something that we've talked about today and we haven't done, and I think it's really important to do. Because it might give us some, some sort of evidence as to whether uh, 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 impeachment is part of a kind of teasing problem in the market, or whether it's characteristic of the market. Um, yeah, I'm open to other ways of slicing it in. I think that the regional and the quality of democracy slicing is kind of obvious. I, I tend to worry for technical reasons about slicing it. 
if the uh, partisanship in this country continues to grow and the extremes of the political parties yeah. control the parties, it seems possible that every time the House, in the future, sometime in the future, every time the House uh, is controlled by a party other than the president, they're going to impeach him. Is there any, are there any official sanctions for many of these countries for frivolous impeachments, or is that just left up? So, so that's an interesting question. Uh, I have been on the case. We weren't looking for that. Um, but the, 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 the sh it's not clear to me that the sheer frequency of the impeachment calls, let alone successful impeachment, provides the necessary predator for the worry of striving at the global level. Um, this is this is almost 30 years of data across uh, 120 uh, countries. A lot of countries, a lot of years, there are a lot of countries. And yet we're actually not seeing, like, we're not seeing impeachment as a regular part of the city of And I would know, I, I, this, this, I'm now a little bit on the I think that this data from 19 Covers an awful lot of places that are pretty poor. Lots of poor areas. We're not generating. We're not generating huge amounts, huge volumes of poor people. And um, remember this chart. It's quite plausible to think, as your question implied, that um, uh, degrees of polarization have changed over time, and that there's a secular increase. What you would expect to see in this graph was at some point some uptick. You don't, you don't see it, right? Um, in the poor, and the polarization point, by the way, is kind of a bit of the story or this, this theory that we have here again, that we would see a spike in impeachment after the financial crisis. Right? Because the financial crisis was associated with failures of the Sabbath party regime. We saw a bunch of party realignment, a bunch of dissolving. You would imagine, well, isn't that going to be a moment of rest? And it really surprised us. It really surprised us that we don't see a peak here. Right? And I, I, and I, I completely see the logic that you're pushing on. Right? And I, I think that, you know, another way I could have presented this is to say, well, look, you know, we would have expected, we think that there's more polarization from about 2008, 2009 onwards. And we would expect to see some sort of secular trend upward in one of these three lines. And yet the lines are pretty darn stable, right? And so, just like the data defeated my prior about when and how calls for impeachment occur, I think it, it also doesn't support the premise of the fact, right? But in this, but, but the question is really correct. I share the impossible data, but when I look at the data, I don't. No, no. Um, uh, much depends upon the design. Um, and, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, countries like France that have a runoff system, right? In a runoff system, what you see is uh, where you have a state one vote, where they have a huge highest vote against each other. That actually encourages. I think we're out of time. Thank you so much. Please, please join me.